Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Radically Loved. I am joined by a very special guest. And, you know, I, I say that because every guest is special, but our guest today is probably a career highlight for me. So thank you, Kiara, for being here today. That's so kind. It's <laughs> my pleasure. It truly is. I We were just chatting a little bit before we started, but your writing just across the board has really created um, so much opportunity and inspiration for Latinos everywhere, Hispanic people, Spanish speaking people. Um, I have felt so encouraged and seen by your work. And it's one of those things that we, well, for me, I admire um people that are telling the types of stories that you tell because i feel like mine matters and uh so i want to say thank you for that first of all and i just i i want to welcome you to the show i'm, I'm excited to have this conversation with you thank you uh, your story does matter i mean that's clear from you know the people that are listening to the podcast even when you're interviewing people we can we feel your story and and you kind of staking your claim with your story and, and you're gonna have a book soon so we'll get to know more of your story through that yes and it was a very daunting experience for me you know one of the things that i wanted i've i've always wanted to ask you sometimes i talk to you, you know, especially as I read your books, I'm like, I wonder what happened here. I wonder how this is different. Mm -hmm. And when she mm -hmm. wrote her first uh, play, like now she's writing this memoir, what was the different, you know, what was the energy between the two? Because I know that with your, um, your, your playwriting, you talk about them being fictional characters, right? You say this is, these are fictional characters that are obviously related to maybe similar stories that you knew personally, but writing a memoir was obviously different than writing a play, I would imagine. So um, the book that really inspired me the most, especially while I was writing mine, was your, uh, your memoir, um, My Broken Language. So can you tell us a little bit more about what the energy was like writing this story and if for the people that are watching this or listening to this um maybe just like a brief description of what that story is about what your memoir is about so it's it's called my broken language and um it's a memoir of my youth so my early childhood up through i i would say the moment in my 20s when i became a woman when i became an adult um you know when i quote unquote came of age. Um, and it's called my broken language because I was saturated in and surrounded by many different languages throughout my life. Um, Spanish, English, and the hybrid form Spanglish. I was a musician. And so there were many different musical vocabularies that were part of my upbringing um, from my aunt's rock and roll music and classical music to my mother's bata drumming. Um, there were also a lot of spiritual languages surrounding me growing up. My mother, um, I got to witness, I got a front row seat at her path towards becoming a Lukumi priestess, towards becoming a Santera, crowned in Chango. And I also went to Quaker meeting. So there were so many different languages around me. I saw the visual languages of her Afro-Caribbean altars in our living room, but I also would go to the Philadelphia Art Museum and see the visual languages of Western modern art like Marcel Duchamp. And um, out of all those different languages, I had to decide how I wanted to speak. And I did want to speak all my life I wanted to. And that you did in uh, ways that we were able, to, we've been able to enjoy in the stories that you tell. Um, I found so many similarities just in your story. Um, you know, you talk about sort of growing up on two different sides 
of the tracks, right? Like having the two different experiences mm -hmm. um, with your parents. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Yes, well, I'm a mix. My background is mixed. So my father is a white Jewish man uh, from Long Island. Um, my mother is a brown Boricua woman from a large, diverse family, racially family, but mostly brown Boricua women, actually. It's a very matriarchal family. Um, and so once my parents separated at when I was a very young age, my life split in two. I was mostly uh, raised by my mom and my stepfather, who's also a Boricua man in Philly. Um, but I did still go visit my father and that was out in the main line, um, which is a far more white area um, and it's more affluent too. So I had this very split brain and I didn't understand why the Brown Boricua family, I saw their reality held up against this kind of American dream suburbia. And it started to irk me big time as a child. Um, there were there were these like wonderful magical secrets that what I, I refer to them in the book as the Perez women, because it's the Perez family. My grandmother was Obdulia, or as we called her, Abuela Julia Perez. And they did have these magical secrets. Um, they could dance in the midst of horrific loss in a way that was cathartic. And it was awesome to me to see this. You know, I remember, you know, these were um, war on drugs times, these were HIV AIDS times, and there was so much loss, so much loss. And it was a lot of young, you know, or untimely death. And it hit close to home. And yet, you pop in the tape, we hear Bachata Rosa, and the dance elevates to such an ecstatic place of release. It was really gorgeous. And I was like, okay, my family out in the suburbs, they don't have that special sauce, but damn, they got like clean streets and, you know, and manicured lawns. And what's going on here? What is this American project that is now my life? Yeah. God, that, that is where I really felt my story live in literature. I really felt that same um, experience in that because obviously like growing up in East LA during the LA riots in this uh, very much immigrant family neighborhood hub in East LA and seeing um, the uh, chaos that gang violence was, was mm. inciting during this time, I mean, they call it, you know, now they, they look back and they call it the decade of death. You know, it was just, there was a lot of wow. just uh, unsupervised children because all the families, all the parents worked. And so they grew up to be adolescents and they were causing havoc, right? It's sort of this disenfranchised youth experience that was causing that, um, yeah, like, the chaos that was happening all around us. Meanwhile, my abuelita would host these rosarios, you know, these prayer circles mm -hmm. and have these women come together. And I sort of learned the importance of ritual, the importance of prayer. And as you're saying, like the sort of celebration and, and in the midst of going through these really scary, horrific things, there was still so much love and so much grounding in these like family traditions and pulling from um faith and and believing in spirituality and being able to um stay grounded in the sense of okay even though this is happening externally there is still something very much present that is grounding you on this earth in this plane even though part of my story right is the cognitive dissonance of okay but if all of this is real why is all this bad stuff happening mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. I felt that in your realization of, okay, wait, why is this family here doing this? And why is, why is this then facade look different from the, the facade of where the people that I love as well are, right? Does that make sense? Well, you know, can we talk about this notion of chaos for a second? Because, yes. Um, I could feel that there was something in the kind of 
physical design and landscape and architecture of the suburbs. That was really, even as a child, I'm talking seven years old, eight years old, that, that there was something about it that was in a false way trying to contain a chaos, trying to mask a chaos that is a natural component of life. You know, I don't wish chaos or suffering on anybody. However, both of those things do bring one closer to life's essence, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, these moments when, for instance, in the book, the book's plot covers four moments when, for lack of a better word, I experienced something like a possession and really lost myself. And these are moments of storytelling and writing in my life. And what happened in those moments was that I was able to ride the chaos of life in an, in a way that, that was created like tremendous flow and power. I was able to harness the chaos that was around me and true to life. Um, as opposed to this kind of suburban approach of the more order we create, the less chaos exists. I'm not sure that that actually is how the universe works, you know? Right. So I was very distraught about my family's suffering in those times, about the losses, the struggles. Um, and yet it felt like there was a more honest embodiment of, of the life and death questions that humanity deals with every day. It didn't feel like we had, honestly, we didn't have the bandwidth to, to be constructing facades. We had to deal with life and death every day, you know? Um, and prayer was certainly part of that. You know, our cooking together, it was very physical, you know? Mm -hmm. The churches, yeah, there were churches that we went to, but our bodies were our churches. You know, our, our bodies were the liturgical flesh and blood, you know? We had migrated so far in Puerto Rico, we migrated from place to place. Then we migrated to the Bronx and we migrated to Philadelphia. So our church came with us, our nature came with us. And, and we did, even though there was more pain and suffering, it also felt like there was more honest living. And I think that the thing about my coming of age as a child is, the truth is living that honestly scared the crap out of me. Yeah. I wanted it to feel, I wanted life to feel like the suburbs, but I knew life isn't like that. Yeah. Yeah. But that to me is the meat of your story. And that's where I'm saying, like, I really felt myself reflected in that because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the truth of life. That is the actual reality. We have this we i'm just saying generally people um that don't experience the um chaos or or death in that way um it's almost like this thing that doesn't exist right whereas opposed to you you growing up having to grapple with death and and illness right and having um these spiritual awakenings in your life mm -hmm. cre created this deeper understanding of how we move around and how we move about in the world, that it's not all rainbows and butterflies, right? And I, I hear that sometimes whenever I, I talk in this way that people say that I, I sound, you know, cynical in a way, but I don't think it's cynical at all. I, I think, I think it's, true i think there is it's it's the reality of life and i feel like a lot of hispanic cultures death is such a prevalent cornerstone to our living our ability to live right um my my dad is always saying like in spanish oh i'm not gonna be here forever like it come visit me right now that i'm alive because when i'm dead you know you're you're not going to, you know, I, I don't want you crying at my funeral, like, come see me now that I'm here. And in a way, yeah, it's like, it's not really, it's a joke, but it's not a joke because it, it just reminds me of the prevalence that impermanence is a, a big constant in, in our daily life. And mess and muck and mud 
it's, it's part of the cycle of life, right? So yeah, there's the rainbows and butterflies approach. It's like arts and crafts versus a work of magnificent chaotic art, right? Both of those are valid, but if you can never get to that ecstasy, the rainbows and butterflies, the arts and crafts, it's not enough. It's not a, a fully saturated experience. And so I was scared. I was scared to be that saturated an experience. And it, you know, I, I would watch it with a remove. I would watch the dance party at Abuela's house. I would watch the, the grief at the funerals. And I was terrified of that. Terrified, are you kidding me? And I was even terrified to dance with my cousins because they could move in a way um, that was real and immediate. Mm. And I was not sure that I could move that way. Um, I wanted to live that immediately. And through the writing, I was able to tap into that. I wasn't trying to pretend. I wasn't trying mm. to put order on thing. I was trying to harness, you know, the energy of life that's out there that can be calm and can be a tsunami. These are all things reflected in nature, you know? Yeah. How... This is why I think that I learned a lot of this from my mother watching her path to be crowned as a priestess because the Orisha are essentially source energy. It's natural energy. And so you learn about kind of the human spirit by seeing the, the, the forces in nature and how they work. And it's not all rainbows and butterflies. That's part of nature. But there's also the lightning strike and there's also the, you know, the whirlwind. Yeah. What was it like for you to go into, to go into your life from that first person perspective and, and have to sort of examine your actual life as opposed to maybe pulling creative moments from, you know, uh, your family members to create a, a, a play or, you know, to write an art piece, as I like to call it. What was it like for you to go into that, into this world, the world of memoir, writing your story? Um, I know that you maybe, I, if I'm correct, from what I remember, you started writing it at the end of 2019 or, or 2020? Mm -hmm. Yep. 2019. Yeah. And, and so were you done by the time the pandemic happened or? Yes, pretty much. I, I was doing some like copy editing and stuff during that time. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of people going into memoir get nervous about is memory and accuracy, right? Cause you hear this all the time. And I was, I was one of the people saying it, I don't remember anything. And literally, I don't remember. I went to so, because my parents separated, I went to so many schools growing up, I don't remember all of them. I don't remember my, who my kindergarten teacher was, second, third, I don't know any of that. I don't know where I went to school from age. I can't remember the building, the, which town, was I in the suburbs, was I in the city? I don't know. So I thought, well, how can someone who doesn't know where, the, where they were from kindergarten through, you know, I remember sixth grade. That's where it kind of starts. How could you write, possibly write a memoir? But the truth is, we do remember. Our bodies, I remember the feeling of that time, of that moment. I remember this feeling, you know, and that is a form of memory. It's, you know, I'm not trying to construct a timeline of events. I'm trying to tell a story about um, growth. So what I discovered was that I remembered a lot more than I gave myself credit for, just because I don't remember who my third grade teacher is or something, you know. Um, but it took process and it took a lot of focus and really paying attention to what those memories were and, and, yeah. and owning them. When I, when I started the book, it was right around the time I started, I went to a, a new therapist and I said to her, well, I'm here because these cousins of mine who were in their twenties, I was very close with them and they, they all passed away, you know, when I was an adolescent and I never cried over them. And yet I, I thought about them every day and it affected everything in my life. So why did I not cry about them? And I think that the book was a process for me to understand how disembodied I had become from 
my own life and my loved ones. Um, and so the process was peeling back a lot of layers, which I've heard you talk about on, on this show before. Um, very investigative into the self, very investigative. And the other thing is I'm used to writing about my family members and I do approach that with a tenderness and a care. I'm very protective of them. You know, if someone, if someone comes at you, it's one thing. Okay, fine, whatever. If someone comes at your loved one, it's like, let's go. You, no, that's not happening. So I was very protective, always writing about my loved ones. When I wrote about myself, I tried to be a little harder on myself, um, be a little more critical about myself. And I did write some things that were very, for me, ugly and painful to admit. Thoughts I had had, silences I had participated in, um, you know, internalized racism, internalized sexism, internalized ageism, even though the book is in some ways a defense of large brown bodies because I come from a family of big plus size women, um, also internalized fat phobia that still existed in there that I was wrestling with. So it was, it was hard to, um, to be honest about those things. Yeah. What was the, what was the feeling that you had the first time you read the final piece through when it was all edited and done? Hi. <laughs> can you, uh, okay, close the door, bud. Sorry. Can you say that again? <laughs> That was permission to move to the next TV show. That's what that was. Um, I just want to know the process of what it was like for you to get that final, the final copy of it. It's, it's done. My broken language is done. You have to give it one more read through. What was it like to read it through when it was I'm going to say done because you've talked about, I've heard interviews where you talk about this before. It's like, is it ever really done, done? And I want to go into that topic here in a minute, but what was it like for you to read it from, from beginning to end when it was complete? I don't know if I've ever, have I ever read it? You know, when I read it from beginning to end was, um, when I did the audio book. Oh which I also got, by the way, it's so good. If you're listening to this, the link is in the show notes. I'm going to repeat this, but you, you read it, right? Yeah. So yeah. Kiara reads it, please. If you're an audiobook person, listen to it. It's so good. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, to read it like that it, out loud in the audiobook, it was challenging. I had a real appreciation for all the actors who um, have brought my work to life over my 20 year career as a playwright. Um, and it put me right back there. Oh my gosh, there was this one scene in, I think the year is 1995 at that point. And um, I'm in high school, I'm in government and politics class at my at Central High School in Philadelphia. And the topic of the day was welfare queens, right? This is, this is how we referred to our sisters, our aunts, not, this is how our nation referred to our sisters and aunts. This is how the headline news referred to the matriarchs of our family, welfare queens. This was, and I had not heard the phrase before. So when it got, when that phrase got dropped in government and politics class, um, you know, it's like my spidey sense went up. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And I, it really blew my mind. The, the conservative boys in the class were like, yeah, you know, they have more babies to get a bigger welfare check. And I knew exactly which cousin of mine they were talking about. And I was, it was a real all hell's no moment for me because I was like, no, I know who you're talking about and you better not look me in the eye and say, that's why she had a child, you know, or, you know, a lot of children. And I, I lost, I really lost my cool and reading that and remembering that. I mean, it took me right back there. I felt like that teenager freaking out in, you know, in government and politics class again. So yeah, it was wild. It was like a time machine. Yeah. I, oh my God, so good. I'm like, this is just, yeah, one of the reasons why as, you know, I read your story and I'm just like, oh, I know exactly what that is like. Um, it reminded me of the first time I 
experienced something similar uh, with my abuelita. Like my abuelita was the one that raised us because both my parents worked uh, and we lived in a house with, sorry, we lived in a two bedroom apartment with seven people, you know, the whole, everybody, the whole family lived there in East LA. And so uh, going to the grocery store with my abuelita and we were in line at the grocery store and uh, the um, the guy checking us out, the teller, what is he called? The uh, cashier. person, cashier. Yes. I'm like, what is this person? They give money, <laughs> they get the money. Um, the cashier um, was talking to a, an older gentleman right before my abuelita was there and said something like, oh, uh, they were having a conversation. We're just sitting there waiting and the cashier kind of motioned like, oh, I, I've got to kind of speed it up. Somebody's behind you. And then he looks over and he goes, oh, those dirty Mexicans? Mm -hmm. No, you can, you can continue the conversation with me. And I remember thinking, like, I asked my ahorita, I'm like, ¿Quién es? You know, mm -hmm. you know, and I asked her in Spanish, like, who, who are dirty Mexicans? What is a dirty Mexican is what I asked her. Mm -hmm. And then she just kept telling me to, like, be quiet. Like, sh don't, don't say anything. And I just was so confused. Like, what, what is he, why is he saying that? I, I don't understand. And I'm just, like, looking at myself, like, am I dirty? I don't, I don't understand. Like, what what does this mean and when we came back home i i i asked when my dad came home my dad would come home before my mom and i said hey this man at the grocery store called us a dirty mexican what is that and he tried to explain it in a very sort of like loving ex experience for me because he obviously saw that mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand what racism was at that age, but I know that what this man had said, I didn't like it and yeah. it made my grandma sad yeah. and it, it made me feel very angry, you know, and just at that age, you begin to understand, oh, the way I look, there's something wrong with the way I look, even though my, my sister and I, I mean, we're, American, right? But we're Hispanic, like we're Mexican people, you know, like my dad explained the situation where he said, you know, sometimes people are not going to like you because of what you look like and where you come from. And you have to remember that that's okay. And it's their loss. And you have to just remember that you are who you are and you always have to be proud of that. Oh my God, I could get emotional, but yeah, all I could think is him telling me stories of him growing up in this little shanty town in Mexico and not and going to school with no shoes because they didn't have any shoes and he would just go to school with no shoes and his journey to coming to uh, the US and the struggles of, of that and for me to stand there with my grandmother and have somebody say that it just it wasn't just the words right like there's a beautiful quote you say in the beginning of the book, like right when you open. And I wish I had it in front of me so I can say, you talk about the power of words. And- um, Dr. Uh, Moreno Vega's quote. Yes. Yeah, so that's that quote is from Dr. Marta Moreno Vega, who is um, a wonderful scholar and practitioner and cultural creator within the um, Afro-Caribbean community, within the Afro-Boricua community, and within the Lukumi. Uh, tradition and her I, her books are phenomenal. I especially recommend the book Altar of My Soul. Um, and the, the quote that starts the book off is from her and it says that words um, carry power and words have their own ache. I love that. And so, yeah, just coming back to again, just reading your story and feeling seen, I think um, part of the I don't want to say struggle, but I think some of the obstacles that uh, I faced growing up, especially in a world that I'm in now in the world of spirituality or in the world of uh, connection and, 
and radical love and this this sort of path that I took on after you know growing up in an environment like that getting in trouble with the law you know getting arrested and that kind of set me off on this path is was I going to end up to to be a product of my socioeconomic inheritance or was I to change my life and and do something else um there's the again not feeling like you fit in anywhere because you know you're growing up and you know the the kids that are from other countries like you're not for me it's like you weren't from mexico so i i wasn't mexican so i couldn't be part of like my mexican friends because i was american right and then we're also not white so it's like you you know you're everybody's so clicky and you can't really hang out with your white friends because you're like you're not white right so you're left in this sort of in-betweener space where you also go home and watch spanish news and spanish tv but you're also watching like the fresh P prince of bel-air and you're watching like different yeah. worlds and you know uh, silver spoons and you're watching all these shows there's this I, I i don't know how to describe it but but i felt again very seen in your story because i felt like oh this is the place that i was looking for this is the place that felt okay it's the in-between space where instead of feeling like i need to be this or that i realize i can be all of it and i am all of it and and that's perfect it's right? freedom it's like having um a hall pass all the time that nobody knows about because you can't you're not you're not you literally kind of can't be confined in one space um for me especially speaking as uh like biracial um you know interfaith like all of these things there there's just no box that's 100 percent accurate um and i think people who aren't biracial also feel this about um you know questions of identity and labeling you know that there aren't boxes where that are 100 percent accurate and it's actually in the like the fluid motion between them and the straddling of them that you know i did find freedom there i did find freedom there i was like freedom freedom to be countercultural uh, freedom to not fit in, that is a big freedom, especially, I mean, I think about this in middle school, the way the girls would look at their bodies and the, the, the pressure they clearly felt to dress a certain way, uh, to have a, to look a certain way. I did not feel that. It was, I had freedom to not fit in. It was very liberating. I, I yeah. appreciated that, even if it meant that I didn't fit in sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that oh, I love that. There's so much power in in that freedom. Um, one of the things that I was reminded of too uh, when I was reading was, uh, I guess my experience of that was being in an environment where there was a lot of gang violence, and if you wore a certain color, it was not good in a certain neighborhood. So you had to be careful with going from point A to point B because yeah. you're traveling, you know, through certain neighborhoods. So my remedy to that was, oh, I'll just be like a punk rock kid. You know, I'll just wear black all the time because it's safe. And, you know, I don't have to worry about fitting in anywhere. I don't have to choose. And it gave me a sense of uh, individuality and really feeling into, oh, I'm doing this to be safe, but I actually like not having to make a choice you know it it feels nice to be able to have that yeah that freedom to just be this person um there's another question god you said something and i'm like oh, i want to come back to that now i'm trying to remember what you said um there was like so much so much was said um but with regard to the empowerment that you have now with your belief system or your faith um how how is it how did it help you no i want to reframe that in regard to your belief system now where are you in your spiritual journey would you say today today is a very specific uh response for that for me I, I do think more and more that you know the faith i carry um 
is earth-based and body-based. Um, that's just the lineage I inherit. You know, my ancestors were farmers in Puerto Rico. Um, they passed on their knowledge of indigenous science and of the land. Um, my mother and my aunts took that knowledge to places where there was much less land, like North Philly, and yet somehow uh, created gardens in, you know, places of vast, vast stretches of concrete and play, you know. So I inherit these kind of um, earthbound and bodybound um, spiritual lineages. And what just happened is this is why I'm, I, I am excited to talk to you this week in particular, is that a new baby just came into our family. And so I'm the oldest sibling. So I had, I had my babies first. My babies are not babies anymore. Um, and when you have your own children, you know, that's a, that's a zone. That's a whole space you're in. Um, it's very particular, but when you're at the side of a delivering woman, uh, especially if she's, you know, a sister, it's a whole different energy and you see it in a different way. So I got to get in the car and drive down the New Jersey turnpike, you know, when, when the contractions were six minutes apart, we're timing them on zoom and, um, or on FaceTime and. I said, I'm getting in the car, I'm coming down, I'm still going to make it in time. And to help, uh, you know, my loved one labor, to help her bring that newborn home, you know, this was, this was the church, this was the church again. This was the land again. This was the farm. Our plot of land is in a different location now. It's in our bodies here. It's in Philadelphia. It's, it's, you know, bookended on the New Jersey turnpike but we still have it, we still got it. And it was very sacred. So I felt really grateful to be given that moment to, to rise into. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. It's like our bodies have become this place of worship now, right? So I wanted to ask you with regard to where we are in our society, how, there are a lot of people that are sick that maybe neglect their bodies and don't really focus on their physical form um, as much as maybe maybe they should. I know it's it's a big topic in uh, communities of color, right, where um, diabetes is is higher in these communities, um, heart disease, and um, I feel that we've become less of a movement society over the last, I don't know, I would say maybe like 20 years where it feels like now with technology, which has, yes, helped us very much, it's created a more sedentary mm -hmm. uh, experience, right? We're watching TV, we're on our computers, we're working from home, we're playing video games, you know, whatever it might be. Um, do you think that that has anything to do with why mental illness is at an all time high? Oh, wow. I, you know, I don't have the expertise really to weigh in on that. Um, but I do think that one of the, the ills of American society is it, it's a very disembodied nation. You know, and I don't, that's less a comment on like health concerns. I don't feel that I have the, the authority or the knowledge to really weigh in on that, but it is an existential and a spiritual and a philosophical observation, um, you know, that to us, the intellect reigns supreme, um, yeah. the thought, the rationality, hopefully, I mean, maybe, maybe some might argue that maybe I'm arguing with myself, but, you know, it's a very mind driven um, and my, and in mind, there's status, you know, and, and all of these things. And it's just like, well, where's the body? Where's the spirit? Where's the energy? Um, it's very disembodied. And I find that tremendously unhealthy. This is why it was exhilarating to be in a situation this week where there is only body and spirit, Yeah. you know, and, and the, the amount of presence required 
to simply ride the wave of one contraction, rest for two minutes, and then mount the wave of the next contraction. It requires, you, you just shed all of those taboos and inhibitions about, you know, well, the body ain't where it's at. You know, what you gotta say, what argument do you have? Okay, fine, put that out aside. It was very liberating and healing for me. Um, you know, the other thing that it brought to mind, and you, you did ask about health, and this is a little bit um, answering question A with uh, <laughs> creating my own question here, but <laughs> my sister was telling me about her experience at a birth center that she went to, and she said it was a, a completely 100% consent-based experience. And I am very familiar with the notion of consent when it comes to sexual interactions and intimacy. But I actually, having delivered two children, was completely unfamiliar with the notion of consent when it comes to medical uh, practice. And it really blew my mind. And I thought, you know, she said every time the midwives or the nurse practitioners would do something as simple as take her blood pressure, they would say what they were doing first and ask if it was okay. And I, I had two very high medical intervention deliveries, um, which were unpleasant experiences. They were really hard and very intense things were done to my body not only without consent without even telling me what was happening and it hurt and it was rushed and and so this notion of consent i think at a time when clearly the american public with vaccinations and all this stuff there's still a lot of distrust and questioning around the medical establishment you know i was like this notion of consent in mainstream medicine, I think is one that I understand now and that maybe should be paid more attention to. Wow. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I think that um, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it's something that I hadn't thought about until even the last couple of months. You know, I mentioned to you that uh, Tori, my partner, and I had uh, gone through, uh, COVID and that was really, really difficult for us. And just having that experience going, having to go to the hospital two different times mm. because there was like some situation with, uh, uh, oxygen levels for Tori. And for me, I was having major debilitating panic attacks that I hadn't had since I was a teenager. Wow. Um, and both were really, uh, it, it bizarre experiences but having nurses and doctors come in and and ask you know is this okay i'm going to do this now was really interesting um because i had another set of friends that had um one of them actually had uh one of their parents passed away from from covid yes. and the other parent was also hospitalized and they ended up uh, intubating him uh, without his, there was like some consent thing that it was like what the process they were doing, they weren't telling him what he was doing. He didn't speak English. So it was a very sort of um, violating experience is the way that he described it. He said, I felt very like disregarded, like nobody asked me or told me what they were doing to me. And they just started putting things and wow. injecting me with things. And it just felt like I just wanted to know what they were doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's so, it's so, uh, I, I think we just definitely undervalue not only our own voice, the power of our voice, the power of our our ability to ask questions and the power of our physical body. I mean, you were talking about the the dancing and the shaking and being able to express and exercise, right? Like an exorcism, like you're literally exercising your body. And I believe that we're able to process this. I don't remember exactly the study of, uh, oh, I, I remember now. Is it here? Wait. The name of the book is called Waking the Tiger. And it's um, by 
please somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'll just edit the right answer in here, but I believe it's Peter Levine, uh, Dr. Peter Levine. The name of the book is called Waking the Tiger. And he talks about the study of uh, how anger moves through the body. And the study that they're doing, they're doing, uh, they're observing ducks in this pond. And they see these two ducks come together and then they have a little spat. They start kind of like fighting and then they see both the, these ducks move away from each other and then they open and extend their wings and then they shake them out and then they self-regulate and move back. And it's, you know, nobody's <laughs> holding the, the receipts saying, oh, well, an hour ago you came at me and, <laughs> you know, it's not like the duck isn't going to go back to the same duck and tell them why they now resent them and why they're going to withhold love from them. Um, but we somehow allow all those emotions to get locked in our bodies. And, and the, the reason why I'm saying that is because I want to tie it into the idea of embodiment and movement and what you're saying about how we are a very disembodied society. I mean, even social media is a disembodied way of connecting with others. Oh, yes. Right. And how and how that affects us is something that we still have. We don't know. I mean, for me, the big thing and again, like, yeah, I'm not an expert. Kara's not in here saying that she's a mental health expert or like a doctor but you are very knowledgeable and let's be honest you're an award-winning writer i mean like you know something about something right like let's you know give credit where credit is due um i think about all of the creative energies that we can harness and how that is connected to our ability to embody all of those gifts to embody our skills, to embody our emotions, to embody our lives. And this is the difference, right? Somebody that's disembodied is maybe not going to feel as connected to their life than somebody who is embodied, right? Yeah. You know, I, I think that when, when we are very physical, it's a form of processing. You know, you, you're talking about social media and, and I writers know more than anyone how inadequate words are really in the face of human, um, you know, accomplishment and torment and heart and spirit, right? And, but a lot of social media reduces our, our exchanges and our relationships to words, which I do contend though I'm in the business of words they're really really inadequate and you know they they don't in any way they supplement but don't replace just mm -hmm. vibing with someone right the vibe the spirit the energy the flow the chill like you know at, have you ever had that kind of friend that you can literally be like quiet with for half an hour you know that's a, that's real that's real. And then you have the friend that you can laugh like a dummy with for, you know, and cackle with, right? These are not words. These are, these are modes of being in the world. And when you, you can do that alone, or you can be, be in that space with someone else creating a, a mode of being together, you know? So, um, I did feel as a child because, because my mother's, um, spiritual practice was um, Afro-Caribbean as a priestess of Lukumi. There's a lot of drum involved. Um, and I started to feel the connection at some point between what was happening with the drum, with the bata, which is an orisha, um, and what was happening with my cousins dancing so ecstatically and full bodied. What was happening with the grief? I thought our voice, the, the drum is a voice, we have a drum inside us. That is our voice. That is our heart. These things are connected. These are the sacred practices of being alive, being an animal, having a flesh and blood body as part of our existence, you know? And then it made sense to me. I started to understand who we were in a bigger context, um, you know, that our, our body was part of the church, 
our body was like the physical manifestation of the drum, but then the, the reverberation and sound is, is, is that's the vibration that comes from the physical manifestation. It was very exciting to me to make these connections, though they were intense. It was like a lot of God around me a lot of the time as a kid. And also I didn't have those powers. I didn't have the power of dance, nor did I have the power that my mother had, which was um, she was deeply connected with the spirit world in a way, in an uncommon way. I saw amazing things happen. You know, um, she would the dead would come and announce themselves to her, and she she would see this. She would see before people passed away, um, and so to be around this tremendous physical power and to not have it. I had a front row seat at a pretty damn good show growing up, you know, but then the question comes at a certain point, well, what are you going to do with it, Kiara? Yeah. It's so good. I mean, I want to, <laughs> I feel like we're just starting the conversation. I want to be respectful of your time. <laughs> and I just feel like that is a great place to, uh complete this conversation even though i feel like it's an opening to continue the conversation but i um i just i'm so grateful for you and for the work that you do and for sharing your experiences with us and thank you for um creating works of art that reflect people like me's experience um because it makes us feel like we matter and like our stories are important. Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for doing that. Pleasure. Truly. And um, that being said, um, I have one final a a question to ask you that I ask all of my guests. Um, but before I do that, where can people learn more? Where can they go for more information about you? Well, um, my book is for sale at all the bookstores at wherever you want to get the books. Um, and I, my website is kiara.com and that talks about some people have heard of my plays, some people have heard of my book, but if you want to get a, a broader sense of my kind of multi-writer path, um, yeah, it's kiara.com, Q-U-I-A-R-A.com. We will add uh, all of those links in the show notes. If you're watching this video on YouTube, it'll be in the description below. If you're listening to this, wherever you get your podcast, uh, it'll be in the info button and you can connect with Kara there. Are you, do you hang, do you do social media at all? I know you have a presence. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. So that's, oh boy. I don't remember my handle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes, everybody. We'll look at it. We'll put it in the show notes so you can check it there. So the final question. I created this podcast as a way to uh, just create essentially a, a community, a support system to uh, have people feel supported. And the whole idea of why I started Radically Loved was uh, the idea that we are radically loved and supported by God's source, whatever you believe, whatever power, nature, that the universe works for us, not against us. And so the final question to you, Kara, is how do you feel radically loved? <sighs> Many different ways. Uh, and it's such a gift, all of those different ways. Right now I feel radically loved um, when I'm able to accept real help and support being offered from others not a little favor here. I'm talking real support and I can just accept it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending time with us. And, uh, as I said, I'm just, I'm so beyond grateful for you, for everything that you do, all of your work. And, um, I'm looking forward to continue to see, uh, more, no pressure. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here and to you, the listener, thank you so much for listening. Please remember to share this with anybody who you think would gain value from this conversation. We appreciate you and we radically love you.